Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the BNH event space. I would like to welcome you all to my seminar today about landscape photography. Um, once again, thank you, uh, BNH event space, for hosting me today. Uh, before that, let me just briefly introduce myself. My name is Carl Weiling, and I'm a professional landscape photographer based in New Jersey. So my background is medicine. I, I, I am a medical doctor. Uh, I, I studied medicine um, in... Um, yeah, I, I'm a medical doctor and I'm a research scientist at Princeton University. About four years ago, I decided to quit my job and become a full-time landscape photographer. So in the past four years of my career, I focused mostly, mostly on running photo tour, uh, teachings and presenting seminars and so on. I also work with different company as their ambassador as, 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 and as their um, advisor and consultant. So I think running photo tour and seminar allowed me to, to be able to travel. I love traveling. So combining my job with travel and photography is the best part of being a landscape photographer. Just to show off what I got in the past few years. And today I would like to share with you some of my images and a few pieces of advice how to get a better image in landscape photography. Yeah, before I start, I just want to share with you a short slideshow from my trip to Antarctica early this year. I hope you enjoy the show. Okay, let's get into landscape photography. The first question I would like to ask you all is that what is landscape photography and how do you justify that this is a good or bad image? Let's take a look into this example here. So this image were taken in Dolomites in Italy. The first image here was taken in the, in the morning, I think around 9 to 10 a.m. And a second image, almost the same shooting spot, but this one was taken in the afternoon. And this one, it's in the morning before the sunrise, after the sunrise and sunset. So let's get back to the first image. And after seeing all these five images, what do you think? What is the elements that make a good image? And obviously in this case is the lights. Of course, we have other elements like compositions, post-processing and so on, but lights play a major role in this example here. So early in the morning and in the afternoon, the harsh light, the hard, hard, the, uh, the so-called high contrast or uh, midday light give your image um, nothing special, no, just no more than a snapshot or so-called postcard shot. But if you know this area well, this is the mountain area that can get foggy in the morning due to the high elevation and the temperature difference. 
and we are shooting toward the direction of the sun. So the sunrise is around this spot here. So the sky can be colorful around the sunrise. And when the sun keeps going up, it will reach the point that when the sun just stops at the peaks of the mountain. With the smaller f-stop, you are able to get a nice sunburst on top of the mountain. So what's happened during sunset? During sunset, the sun go to the other side of my camera and then the front lighting cast the golden light on the peaks of the mountains and on the cloud. At the same time, it makes the uneven ground look three-dimensional due to the low angle sunlight. So as a conclusion here, landscape photography is more than just going to a beautiful place for a, a postcard shot or snapshot. If you want to make your image look different from other, you have to master at least five of these. The basic technique, the most simple thing once you get your camera, how to use a camera, how to set your camera, how to use a filter, tripod, and so on. And then in this example, uh, I've shown you that it's, it's very important to be in the right place in the right timing. And finally, the compositions and post-processing. I would talk more about this in the later on in my presentation. So the essence of landscape photography is that it's an art of seeing the unseen. We always try to shoot something that are not easily seen in our daily life or by the naked eye. And today I'm going to share with you a few pieces of advice how to see the unseen. The first, capture the moment with using the lights and weather. So understanding the lights and weather is one of the most important elements in landscape photography because it allows us to capture the moment. When I talk about the moment here, the moment in, in photography can be anything. The moment in trial photography, in portrait photography, in documentary photography can be an unexpected event, the facial expressions or the interaction between two people or interaction between two animals and so on. However, landscape photography works very differently. Understanding how the weather and lights works and how we can use them efficiently are the key that allows us to capture the precise moment in landscape photography. So the key is that you have to know where to go, when to shoot, and what to expect in different lights and weather condition. You can get the most from your trip. This is the most challenging part of landscape photography. And here is a drone image of Rhina in Lofoten. And for those who has been here, this is a very popular spot in the past few years in, in the Arctic Norway. If you have been here, you probably recognize some of the most iconic mountains and villages here. And the number here indicate five of the most common shooting spots of the fishing village in Lofoten. Believe it or not, if you know where to go, you can get a good light in all these five locations in one single day. I've done it before. I've done it many times before. We have a lot of success. But of course, um, when we talk about the weather, you need a little bit of luck. You need to pray. <laughs> okay. So in this day before the sunrise, there were a big snowstorm. So you see a lot of snow cover on top of the mountains and, and, uh, and the cabin. And as expected to the forecast, the snow stopped and the sky clear up during the sunrise. So the first light illuminate the mountains beautifully. Soon after that, we go to the bridge um, and capture the, the moment when the sun illuminate the mountains and the village here. And again, for those who has been here, you can rarely see the snow accumulate on the mountains and on the rock because they were easily swiped away by the winds and the waves. So this is a very precious condition after the heavy snowstorm. So I always tend to be here or plan to be here um, when there's a big snow, uh, snowfall or snowstorm a day before uh, uh, our visit. And after that, we run to this spot and we can expect a refraction in the windless day. When there's no wind, you can see the refraction everywhere, but the refraction will be gone very quickly when the temperature drop because the still water, although this is a salt water, will get frozen in low temperature. So you have to catch the right moment to capture the refraction. So in the winter time in the Arctic Norway, the sunrise and sunset just um, like 
three four hour park so after a small a short coffee break we can we can get ready for the sunset so for the sunset we went to this iconic spot and captured the alpine grove on top of the mountain again as i said the reflection rarely happened in this part of the world due to the wind when this happened you know that this is the moment that you would never want to miss and after the after the sunset we ran to this spot for the brew hour the cold turn render the peace and calm emotion so as you can see to be in the right place in the right moment is the key to success in landscape photography the the reason is simple because the best light just doesn't happen in any times of the day so when we talk about the light when we talk about the natural light um, in landscape photography we often focus on two his of um, two moment uh, the first is called the golden hour and second is called the brew hour. The golden hour happens when the sun is in between plus to minus six degree around the horizon. So it's happened around the sunrise and around the sunset. But the brew hour happens when the sun is in between four to eight degree below the horizon. So it's happened before the sunrise or after the sunset. And golden hour and brew hour are collectively known as magic hour. So as the name implies, magic always happens in this, this period of time. So as I mentioned, um, in other branches of photography, um, it can easily trigger the emotion simply from expression of face, the unexpected event or interaction between the people and so on. As for landscape photography, if you want to trigger the emotion and mood of the viewer, one, uh, the most important is weather. This is one of the most important factor in landscape photography. Let's take a look into this example. This is Gasadaru from Faroe Island. Um, so this is a, I can say this is the iconic landmark of Faroe Island. It's a small village here. I think 40 people live here with a nice mountain in the background with a nice waterfall in front. This is a fun, here's a funny story about this shot. Uh, this was taken about three years ago during my photo tour to Faroe Island. It was a nice day in the morning, in the daytime. So I, I took my client to uh, to do some hiking, to shoot the puffin. We, we have a lot of things done in the daytime. It was a nice, perfect day to, to be out there in the field. By the time they, they were back to the hotel, they were so tired. They want to go to bed. And I saw the storm is coming and the cloud was changing dramatically in the direction of the sunset. So I told my client, something will be happening tonight. Who want to get out? Okay. So half of them say, let's get out and, and see what's happened, what we can get tonight. But half of them say, I don't care. I just want to go to bed. That's fine. That's okay. So by the time of shooting, it was rainy, foggy, a little uh, misty. Uh, it was cold. It was not the present that the shoot. We were cold, we were wet and our lens and camera were wet so we have to wipe the lens wipe the filter and shot wipes and shot just not a good day to shoot but guess what when the sun is just touching the horizon at this point here magic happened the rain and the fog just spread out the golden light throughout the, the, the landscape and this just lasts for about i think about two to three minutes that's it so you could get what is the reaction of those people who were sleeping in the hotel when those, they saw this photo next morning. This is what I mean the moment. Once you miss it, you will never ever see it anymore in your life. I have been here more than 10 times, more than 20, maybe 20 times. But I don't think I will see the same phenomena again in the same place in the rest of my life. So the golden hour, the golden tones uh, and the red tones in the golden hour give the image the sense of warmness, energetics, and dynamics. So this is the emotion triggered by the golden hour. The same place, same times, in the different days, in the different weather and like condition, the thick, dramatic lookings and ever-changing cloud give the image sense of um, cool, moody, and even a little bit of depressed, a little bit of upset. So just like a rainy day, just like um, an overcast day, you're sitting at home, um, you can't get out, you look out a window, you feel a little bit depressed, a little bit upset. So this is the emotion triggered by the overcast weather. But the misty day are perfect for capturing the atmospheric photo. It's rendered a sense of mysterious and dynamics.
most of the people hope that we we could get a clear sky, blue sky, cloudless day, calm days for the photo trip. But this is good for traveling because this is good for sun buffing, but not something that we want as a landscape photographer. Well, this is something we are hoping to have. Let's take a look. Okay, this is a uh, how crazy weather um in in Lofoten in Norway. So how can I describe the crazy of the wind? My forty pound camera bag was rolling in the beach, so you could imagine how strong it was. So, but the storm are just excellent opportunity for dramatics and moody landscape images. The dark, blowing clouds on the wild dramatic sea can just make for spectacular image. As you can see, this is a rather boring beach here. No interesting foreground, just maybe two big rock here. But after the storm, after the, the, um, the heavy snowstorm, it's now become a very unique landscape with the striped patterns here uh, become your leading light and your foreground element. So as, the Don, as Don McCullin said, there's no such thing as bad light, just misunderstood light. So the key is that, you have to know when to shoot, where to go, and how to utilize the light. Then you can get the most from the trip. And next thing I want to share with you is how to add the elements of dynamism into your landscape photography. I just want to share with you this very interesting figure here. And because for, for, for decades, for a long time, since the invention of the camera, Many people have been content that camera is a recording instrument. We use camera to record what we see with the naked eye. But let's take a look at this interesting figure and find out how similar it is between the camera and our eye. So when we talk about the camera lens, the widest lens that I will produce for the camera is 4.9 millimeter fisheye lens. But the longest lens I will produce for the camera is 5200 millimeter. This is a big monster that no one could ever carry it. But this is what uh, has been produced for the camera. If you want to go for the longer focal lengths, you could use astronomy telescope. You can give, it can give you up to 8,000, 10,000, even 13,000 millimeter of focal length. But the human eye is equal to 17, and another study says 24 millimeter wide angle lens. And, and in the other words, our, our eye is a fixed wide angle lens. Obviously, we can change the lens. And the ISO of the camera can range from 50 and can go as high as 4 million, while the ISO of the, of the eye can go from 1 to 800. That's it. So in the other words, the, the eye is not quite competent in the low light condition as the camera. Aperture of the lens, it depends on the design of the of the lens, it can go from 0.9 or it can go from to uh, small as 32, 40 or 60 something. Uh, we have the aperture as well, which is our pupil. So it ranged from 2.1 to 8.3, that's it. Shot speed of camera can go from one over 8,000 seconds. It can go as long as you want, while the shot speed of the human eye can go from one over 100 to one over 200 seconds. And I just want to remind you that the shutter speed, ISO, and aperture of the of our eye are all in the auto mode. So apparently, we can change those settings. They are controlled by by our brain. And when we talk about the resolution of a camera, if you have um, sixty thousand dollar, you you want to buy a camera. You can get the best camera. Phase one camera, it gives you up to 150 megapixel resolution. You can print a huge image from it. But when we talk about the human eye, we have the resolution of 576 megapixel, which is three times higher than this $60,000 camera. And we always talk about the dynamic range of the human eye is better than the camera. Yes, it is true. The dynamics of the human eye can go up to 14 stop, while the dynamics of the camera can go up to 11 stop if we have the adjustable pupil. So theoretically, we have 
24 stops of the diamond range. We say, uh, and in the other words, we, uh, the human eye has infinite dynamic range. So if you convert all this figure into your camera, your eye costs that much. Okay, and I just want to remind you that you have two pieces of this camera carry with you all the time. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that camera is not just a recording instrument. It is a creative tool that allows to see the unseen. For example, by using a super high shutter speed, the camera can see the moment when the bow eagle catching a fish, or uh, um, by but the human eye just just can see those moments by using a slow shutter speed camera can accumulate the light that is changing over the time in a single image. For example, um, the waterfall, the waterscape, um, night sky photography, you know, Milky Way, we just can not see those moments uh, with, with our eye. And people have been saying that the landscape photography um, is all about shootings, uh, the mountains, the rocks, um, the water, again, back to the mountains, the rock, the water, things they are dead, things they are static. So in order to add the elements of dynamism into landscape photography, one way to do so is to use long exposure photography. This will convert your normal static blunt scenes into a dynamic masterpiece. Let's take a look at this example. I can see one question here. Um, as about uh, the use of ND filter. So let's dip into this, uh, this question right now. So this is the um, um, Hamnoi village in Lofoten, one over 20 second exposure. This is a nice image, nothing wrong with it. Nice landscape, nice light. But let's take a look what if we use ND filters and long exposure for this image. For, so for this image, if you use a 10 stop ND filter, we could lengthen exposure by 1,000 times. So here's, uh, here's the image with 100 second exposure. So this 100 second exposure, the moving cloud here create the motion blur of the cloud that bring out the movement. So in this image, something they are moving, there's a mo uh, the, the, there's the moving cloud, something they are not moving, there's the mountains and the village. So we create the so-called the motion and static contrast. So an image with the contrast, it's much more appealing in terms of composition. I, I probably, I would guess that you, you are more familiar with so-called color contrast. For example, when you're shooting um, the portrait, you always want the model in the rig dress and post it against the dark blue, a dark green background to create the cold and the warm color contrast. And in this case, in, in long exposure landscape photography, we create a so-called motion and static contrast. At the same time, the long exposure smooth on the water, make it less distracting to the viewer eye. So let's talk a few words about ND filters. It's, um, so ND filters or neutral dance filter is like the sunglasses of the camera. It's come with different strength or darkness level. You can get them from one stop to all the way to 20 stop. But three most commonly used ND filters in landscape photography are three, six, and 10 stop. So three stop length of exposure by eight times, six stop length of exposure by about 60 times, and 10 stop length of exposure by 1,000 times. So they have different application. We use, we often use three and six stop to slightly lengthen exposure time, for example, a few seconds for water scape, for the waterfall, and so on. Uh, we use 10 stop ND filter to significantly lengthen exposure time to a few minutes for uh, for creating the um, the motion blur of the cloud. So this is just an example here, the moving cloud here under the 30 second exposure with six stop ND filter create the motion or the movement. So here, something they are moving, something they are not moving. So we create the so-called the motion and static contrast. Okay, so as and just want to say a few words about this uh, location here. This is um, one of the most popular location on Faroe Island. If you want to take this image, you have to walk from, from here, the parking lot is here. You have to walk uh, around the lake up to this point and then walk up the hill. So it's about five miles of hiking. When you look back, it looks like the lake is hanging in the sky. 
So historically, we call this the slave cliff. Okay, in the Viking era, about a thousand years ago, the Viking people, the rich people, used to throw away the slave into the ocean from here, just right from here. So we call it the slave cliff. Okay, so long exposure also lend itself to so-called a gas host relationship. Okay, what does it mean? So when we look at this image, uh, if I ask you who is the main subject of uh, in this image, and obviously in this case it is the, the mountains and the, the hotel here, because they are iconic, they are representing the Dolomites, they are representing this image. And obviously you can't find those in New York City or New Jersey. So they are representing this location. They are the main subject, they are the host, they are the protagonist of the show. While the sky, the cloud, and sometimes the water in landscape photography, they are mostly act as the secondary element or supporting element or the core star or the gas. So with the use of long exposure, we make the gas or the secondary element blur out, which make it much less distracting to the viewer eye. And this in turn will make your host or the main subject stand out from the cloud. So this is called the gas and host relationship. And long exposure also lends itself to a clean, simple and minimalist styles of composition when they blur out the moving element. So just an example here, I think this was taken in Cape May in New Jersey, 10 stop anti filter, 200 second exposure. So the long exposure makes everything that are moving, the cloud, the, the water here, there are uh, uh, um, blurry result in a very simple and minimalist styles of image. I just want to say a few words about waterscape. This is one of the most well-known and most popular subject in long exposure photography as well as in landscape photography. The water changes appearance as you change the exposure time. This is one over 10 second exposure. Um, so you can see a lot of detail in the water, a lot of short line extending from one spot to the other spot, extending through the direction of the water flow. A lot of short line, a lot of detail. It looks a little bit messy in this image. This is one over 10 second exposure, a little bit slower than the previous one. Again, a lot of short line extending through um, the direction of water flow. But if you bump up the exposure to half a second, one second, and two seconds, let's go back to one second. You can see that the short line just now are joining each other to become a longer line. And now the water appear to be dynamics. Why? Because the line, the longer line extend to, from one spot to the other spot. And this line um, appear to be directional and appear to be dynamic because um, thanks to the, 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 the line structure here. So half a second exposure, one second exposure and two second exposure are probably the favorite timing for landscape photographer because the water looks highly dynamic and you can feel that the water is moving. When they further extend the exposure time to five seconds, 10, 15 second, you can see that the, the lines start disappearing and the water become very smooth. And if you go to 30, 20 seconds or more, the line are completely disappear and the water become very smooth. So that's being said, when you shoot a waterscape, you don't need extremely long exposure time. If you want to make a water looks dynamic, look like it's flowing, all you need is half a second to two second exposure. If you want to make a water look smooth, looks misty, looks dreamy, looks simple, looks romantic, you, you, all you need is 10 to 20 second exposure. As simple as that. In most of the case, we often rely on lower ISO or smaller aperture to extend exposure time. But if none of them work, then we have to rely on three stop or six stop and if you in most of the case to slightly lengthen exposure time. As you can see, most of my image, uh, most of my water skip image in this presentation, they are mostly half a second to two second exposure because the water appear to be very dynamic. So here's another example here. Um, the seascape photography, 
again, this is a boring beach and no interesting foreground here, but we can use the movement of a wave to create our foreground elements. So when the wave is moving back to the ocean with the use of uh, half a second to two second exposure, the wave is now become the streak and this is now become your leading line and your foreground elements. The same for this example here. Um, so this is a nice shore next to a small village in Faroe Island. Nice background, nice mountain range, nice sunlight uh, during the sunset, but the shore just looks ugly, nothing special. So what we can do in this case is that use a long exposure, six stop ND filter, half a second exposure. When the water is flowing back to the ocean, click your shutter speed and the flow of the water is now become the longest streak and that become your leading line and your foreground element. And here's another case for, uh, for, for the water ski photography. And in this case is when the water is rushing toward the camera. Again, half a second to two second exposure, it's allow you to create the highly dynamic looking leading line and the foreground elements. Sometimes we need a longer exposure to handle the reflection. Just like this image here, the sacrosoy in Lofoten. This is a location that you, you rarely see the reflection because it's windy and the water is shallow. But you see the, when you see a little bit of reflection, you know that this is a very precious condition. And then you have to know how to improve your shot. So in this case, I use a 10 stop ND filter, 240 second exposure with this long exposure is smooth to the water, make your water much less distracting and make the movement of the cloud blur out and make it a very simple um, image than the previous one. And the reflection are clearly visible right now. So before I go to the next half of my presentation, just want to share with you a short slideshow from my trip to Greenland in the past, uh, past two years. Okay, I, I, I probably hear some of the question why I'm, I'm so damn lucky to have this rig sailboat following me all the time. So the short answer is money, we pay them. Okay, so this rig sailboat here is actually our model. So that's why they follow us all the time. So if you search online, this is the, uh, this, this sailboat is called Peter the First. And it's actually the first sailboat that circumnavigate the Arctic Circle. It's a world record sailboat. So it's a Russian ex expedition team. Um, so we hire them to come all the way to Greenland and act as our model. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed the, the slideshow and let's get to the next half of my presentation. Um, so how to create a unique field of vision. I, I guess everybody would agree that the grand landscape photography with wide angle lens capture the beauty of the largest scenes. When we talk about the American landscape photography, 
historically, it has been a continuum of great photographer like Adam Anser to capture the biggest scenic image, like the majestic waterfall in, 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 the, in the Yosemite National Park, or spectacular mountainscape like is this image. They're so grand and appealing. So it makes perfect sense for every landscape photographer, including some of you guys, including me, want to capture and communicate the magnificence. This is what thousands of people continue to do this um, um, to do this all the time in landscape photography. With the use of wide-angle lens, we can create a so-called the near foul styles of composition. You can include generous amount of foreground elements, mid-ground elements, background, and sky simultaneously create an image with depth and composition power. So when they're using a wide angle lens, it all depends on how you select the foreground, mid-ground, and background elements to compose an image and to, to uh, expand your creativity. And in the words intimate landscape is one of the biggest paradigm shift in the history of landscape photography. Elliot Porter, who shifted the formation of the interior landscape, he didn't deal with the, the grand landscape view, nor the macro image, but something in between them. So he relied on different sets of, uh, of elements. He no longer relied on finding the foreground, mid-ground, or background element, but he emphasized on um, this sets of elements here, like the detail, texture, patterns, line, color, and shape to compose the image. And this is perhaps the ultimate way of less is more philosophy in landscape photography. It can be done by any lens, but telephoto lens play a huge role in the intimate landscape world. Just an example here, this is Patagonia from Chile. Instead of finding a good foreground and mid-ground elements, I just focus on the mountain and to emphasize on the, this interesting shape, texture, and, and the details of the mountain as well as the change of light. And here, the mixture of texture, the line, the color, make up an interesting intimate landscape photography. This is from the highlands of Iceland. So my advice is that when you're exploring the world with ultra wide angle lens, take out your telephoto lens. Do not hesitate to do that. Take out the telephoto lens, look through the viewfinder, look through the live view and find something that's unique and different from what you are shooting, different from other. Scan through the landscape and find the elements as I mentioned just now. For example, the texture, the detail, the line, the shape, the change of light, uh, as I mentioned just now. So if you realize from some of the most prestigious landscape photography contests in the recent year, most of the award-winning image were actually um, intimate landscape. They were actually taken with the telephoto lens because these image are not quite, not quite often seen by, uh, seen, seen, um, by the naked eye. Again, these agree to the statement, seeing the unseen. Some, for some wider scenery, we have to stitch two or more image to produce a, a larger panoramic cam. Just like this image, a stitch of three uh, GFX cam, uh, GFX, uh, three image from a GFX camera result in 120 megapixel um, image. You can see a lot of fine detail in it. But what I want to show you here is just for fun, this is what, um, uh, what's happened, how it looks like when the day I shoot this image. Okay, uh, again, another crazy days um, in the field. If you want to get to this location, this is on Faroe Island. It's one small island, Faroe Island. You, if you want to get here, you have to take the boat from the main islands. I think about 40 minutes boat ride. And then you have to drive about 40 minutes, pass through, I think, three tunnel, small tunnel. And when you reach the parking lot, you have to hike about two miles to the lighthouse here and walk through a narrow path to the end of the island. And then you look back, it looks amazing. The view is um it's magical, but the, the, the weather here is crazy as hell. So when you walk through this narrow path here, it's a slip 
yeah, done because this is a deep cliff and this is the Atlantic Ocean. So, so I just want to show this for fun, but it's actually not so fun. Um, sometimes we have to, all the time, we have to be very careful when we are shooting out there in landscape photography. Okay, so the last thing I want to share with you is how to use color composition to create a unique, uh, to create something that are not easily seen by the naked eye. The first thing I want to share with you is the height of the tripod. People have been so comfortable to work with uh, the tripod at the eye level, but what you see at the eye level is what everybody see. There's no visual impact, nothing special. When you stand in the higher ground, you can see what others couldn't see. You capture the landscape that usually seen by the birds or usually seen by, by the drone or, or helicopter or plane. So everything is under your feet. You are dominating and you're in control of everything under your feet. So this is the visual impact of high angle shooting. You don't have to climb the mountain. You don't have to take the drone or take the helicopter. Sometimes, most of the time, a few steps walking uphill or elevate a tripod will offer you a completely different perspective. On the other hand, when you're shooting low with the use of wide angle lenses, help you to accelerate the perspective and giving us extra emphasis on the foreground elements. It makes, so in this image, I use the ultra wide angle lens getting very close to these eyes. The eyes is maybe just slightly bigger than my head. So by getting very close to it, I can make these eyes look huge. It looks bigger than the, the mountains. So in this case, I make this, small thing looks big, big thing looks small. So this is also a way of wide angle lens and low angle shooting that could generate a visual tension that trap the viewer eye into the image. So what I'm gonna share with you right now is a new concept about composition using this image. When people see this image, they call it the smiley face. The smiley face here is formed by two rocks and the, and the leaf frozen in a very small pothole. How big is this pothole? This is slightly bigger than my face. So by using wide angle lens, we're getting very close to it. The perspective distortion exaggerate this foreground element. So let me tell you how this image was being crafted. The two process being involved are called element selection and element placement. To tell a story in landscape photography is very different from other branches of photography. As I mentioned earlier, in other branches of photography, the story can be told straight by capturing the, uh, the unexpected event, expression of the face, the interaction between the people and so on. As for landscape photography, when the viewer look at your image, you want them to see the image as a complete story by connecting all the elements in the image together. All the elements in your image has its own role, they are not isolated, they are not isolated and tidy. They have to be interact with each other. So the idea of composition in landscape photography is to create an image with a story. What is element selection? So to create an image, you were just given a tiny frame, a frame with definite size. So obviously you can put everything inside the frame. You have to select the element you want or element that contribute to the story. This is called the addition or plus. For this image, the smiley face, the rocks, the mountains, and the cloud, just four elements, that's it. This is called addition or plus. You have to exclude the element that you don't want or not contributing to the story of this image. This is called the subtraction. For example, the rock next to the smiley face, the garbage next to the smiley face, the dog poop next to the rock, whatever. They are probably interesting or not. But as long as they are not contributing to the story, they are useless for your image. Just leave it outside of the frame. Just throw it away. So this is called subtraction or minus. And somehow this is in concept with the concept, less is more. The most dangerous thing about using wide angle lens in landscape photography is that people always try to fit 
everything. Yes, I mean everything inside the frame, the, the garbage, the dog poop, the rock, whatever, everything inside the frame and result in a highly super duper messy image. So this is the worst thing about using wide angle lens. So keep in mind, leave those useless elements outside of the frame. Keep it as simple as possible. So what is multiplication? So in this image, I use the perspective distortion to make the smiley face looks big. This is called multiplication. In landscape photography, when we uh, introduce the, the foreground element into the image, the foreground elements are usually not iconic or not representing the location or the image. They're usually not the landmark there. Uh, in this case, it's a smiley face, sometimes it's a rock or water. They're not representing the image. So they carry very little visual weight in the image. So in this case, if we enlarge it in the image, we add the visual weight to it so that it could balance with other elements in the image. So this is called multiplication. And what is division? I shrink the element there to reduce the visual weight. For example, in this case, it is the mountain. With the use of wide angle lens, um, I shrink the mountains, make it smaller. When people look at this image, they know that um, this mountain is representing this location. They know that this is a Utah Cliff Beach in Lofton. So it's carry a lot of visual weight in the image. So by making it smaller, we reduce its visual weight so that it could balance with other elements in the image. Okay, so selecting and sizing the elements in landscape photography is the art of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. It is very similar to mathematics, very similar to painting. So once you have this element ready, you have to know how you would like to place them and how you like to decorate them in your frame. This is what I call the element placement. So by posing your camera up and down, left and right, front and back, you can change the positions, the relative positions, the size of these elements in a completely different way. So the, the way I place this element is as follow. The smiley face very uh, in the lower center, very close to the border to create a little bit of visual tension. The rock in the middle left and the, the mountains in the middle right. Well, the moving cloud will create using the long exposure, which aim to create a vector that pull the viewer eye toward the upper right direction. So this, aim, this element will place in a continuous and a zigzag path along the viewer side. When the viewer look at this image, they first draw the attention to the smiley face because it looks interesting, it looks funny, and then the viewer will side will go further to the rocks and notice that oh this is the beach there's a rock the ocean the water here this is the beach and then the viewer side will go further to the mountain and recognize that is the landmark of Utahcliff beach in Lofoten in Norway and finally the viewer side will be drawn toward the upper right corner by the moving cloud so this process leads your viewer to read your story of your image using the elements and the vector. This is called a visual continuity, a way of landscape photographer tell the story. At the same time, these three elements create an implied triangle that's able to trap your viewer eye in the image. Of course, to complete the story, you need other elements. As I mentioned earlier, the lights here, the snowy landscape rendered a sense of coolness, but the golden sunset rendered a sense of warmness. So it is this opposite sensation of force create much more uh, visual interestingness. Okay, to complete the story, um, I would like to emphasize that the importance of post-processing. One of the most important creative process in photography with your unique composition style, with your unique post-processor workflow, it's allowed to create an image that belongs to yourself, an image that has with your unique styles and personality. So to answer my question, my first question in my presentation, how do you define a good image? So by with the technical skill you master, with the use of light, um, knowing the environment, your unique composition style, your 
post-process workflow is allowed to create an image, but how could you call them a good image? Just ask yourself, is your image unique? Is it replicable? Does your image evoke viewer resonance? Does the image carry an emotion story and even documentation and historical value? Does your image evoke imagination of the viewer? Does the image has your own personality and your style? If the answer is yes to all of this, then I would say that you create a good image. So before I end my presentation, just want to share with you a short two-minute slideshow um, the collection of my Aurora image from Norway and Sweden. Enjoy the show. Okay, so before I end my uh, presentation, just want to express my sincere appreciation to my sponsor and partner who supported my career who, uh, over the past few years. And once again, thanks you, thank you BNH Event Space for hosting me today. If you want to look at more of my image, welcome to, to my website, covering.com. And you can follow me on Facebook. Um, I have like 200,000 followers on Facebook. So I update my Facebook every day with new image and information. You're also welcome to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And there are a few ebooks on my website. Feel free to check it out. Some of them are free, some of them um, um, are not. <laughs> so, so I have one ebook about filters and long exposure photography, very detailed ebook about long exposure, and another ebook about my post processor workflow. If you want to support me, um, you can join my VIP membership on Patreon. So, with $5 per month, um, I, um, you could get the, the monthly photo seminar critique and forum. So with that, thank you everyone uh, who attended my seminar today. Thank you BNH Event Space. I will stop sharing my, my slide here and I will take your question. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Kawai. Thank you. We have a couple questions here. Uh, Marcelino asks, as a black and white photographer, I sometimes enjoy the texture and light um, in, in black and white as opposed to color that can be distracting. Do you sometimes do black and white landscapes? Yeah, I, I do black and white landscapes. Sometimes, not all the time, um, simply because black, black and white is just not something that I am very good to do. I'm, I'm very good at. Uh, but I do agree that black and white photography works well with many scenarios like, like um, like when, when you want to remove the, the element of the colors uh, or you want to, uh, or in the middle day of the light, middle day light and so on. Yeah, um, I do it, but not quite often, yeah. Now, Anne is asking, um, do you use vignetting when editing landscapes? Yes, yeah, sometimes I do, um, especially when I try to express the, the moody image or the depressing image. I, I used to do, uh, used to add a little bit of vignette to, to make it more moody and to, yeah. Yeah, I use it when 
when I try to make it more moody, yeah. Okay, we've got a question from Bonnie um, asking, uh, how much editing do you do on your images and, and what editing programs do you use? So I use Photoshop, just Photoshop, cam, Adobe camera, and then, for, uh, and then post processing in Photoshop. I, I would say 50, 50, 50% 50 from shooting, 50% from, from, um, from the post processing, but I, I like color. So I make my image a little bit colorful, a little bit vibrant, but I tend to, as, at the same time, I tend to keep it as close to, um, to, um, to what I see as possible. Yeah. Okay, we got another question um, asking, how many times do you change positions of where you're shooting or composing to get the image you're looking for? Oh, um, so for example, when I'm shooting, when I go to the, uh, shoot a sun, sunset, I, I used to go there maybe like two hour or even three hour before, just look at the, the environment, look at what I could get in this and this place, this location, find an interesting foreground, change the position, change, uh, compose the image, just move your camera around left, right, front and back, up and down, just to get the perfect um, composition and perfect position and then wait for the right moment to come. Very cool. And then uh, Victor asks, um, what kind of tripod are you using and, and um, what backpack have you found to be practical? So I am using the Photo Pro tripod. Um, it is a heavy duty tripod, 36 millimeter um, in the tube diameter. So you can find B and H is uh, called a Photo Pro 84C. So this is a heavy duty tripod, very good tripod, heavy, big tripod, carbon fiber. Um, so it's st stable enough to use in the adverse condition. Yeah. And then your, your backpack? Backpack, I'm using the Shimoda right now. Um, I still have it. I, I was the ambassador some times ago. So it's a good backpack, um, quite comfortable to, to carry. But before that, I use the, uh, the app stop. Uh, backpack, it's very cool backpack, nice, a lot of space, very convenient. So these are some of the backpack I, I prefer, yeah. Okay, now um, uh, Marcelo asks, your pictures look sharp from foreground to background, even shots at F7. Do you stack pictures to obtain um, sharpness? Yeah, sometimes I do the focus stacking, but sometimes I do the so-called double distance focusing or, or the hypo, hypo focal distance. Yep. It depends which one works. Huh? Okay, now we had we had a couple questions about um, ND filters. Mm -hmm. So um, are, do you use graduated neutral density filters? Um, when do you prefer to use an ND filter no matter what time of day you shoot or does it depend on the conditions? Yes, I try to use the graduate neutral density filter as, um, as possible whenever I can use them um, because it gives you the, the exact idea how it looks like um, in, in your image instead of doing the, um, the exposure blending. Sometimes I use the exposure blending as well, but I tend to use the graduate ND filter as possible. As for ND filter, I like it because it's great. Um, as I mentioned, the motions, the motion blur of the cloud, I think it's a cool effect. So I always, I, I, I use them most of the time to create such an effect. So, okay. yeah. Hmm? Uh, yeah, and um, I know we, we talked about focus stacking, but do you do, you do any um, compositing or HDR? Yeah, I think focus stacking and HDR is two different concepts. So focus stacking about focus. So sometimes I do focus stacking, sometimes I do the, um, the double distance focusing. But as for, for the HDR, so this is about exposure, so different from focus. So when we deal with the high contrast scenery, as I mentioned, sometimes we use the, most of the time I use the graduate neutral density filter, but some of, sometimes I use the exposure blending. One should exposure to the sky, another should expose to the ground, and then stack them in the Photoshop to review the well exposed park in the Photoshop with using a layer and mask. I rarely use HDR because HDR 
uh, you tend to give not so natural um, um, looking. But I, I know that some people say that um, the, um, the software today give a very natural looking uh, HDR, but I never try it. I can't comment more about that. Yeah. Okay, now going back to ND filters, Patrick has a question. So he says, longer exposures with ND filters seem to dull colors in my photos. Um, do you have any experience with that at about 60 to 120 seconds? So I'm not sure about what do you mean the dull color? Maybe it's uh, a little bit underexposed, probably. Um, but in in theory, the ND filter, we, we call it ND, the neutral density, is supposed not to interfere the uh, the color of the image. So it should be neutral. So it should not affect the color of the image. But sometimes, most of the time when we are shooting sunset, we um, or most of the time when we are shooting long exposure, like 60 to 120 second exposure, uh, we tend to get a little bit underexposed. Some uh, Most of the time it's due to the change of light, especially in the sunset, the light is getting darker and darker. So you have to slightly lengthen exposure time to get the right exposure. I'm not sure I answered the question, but this is my, my experience, yep. And uh, what camera do you use? <laughs> I, I use Canon for, for the past 20 years since the film era, but I switched to, to Sony um, like two years ago. At the same time, uh, Fuji, Fuji film sponsored me. So I use, so right now I'm using the Fuji and Sony camera. So I use Fuji for most of the, the wide angle works and I use the Sony for, um, for, for the telephoto works. Um, I also, I, I'm also getting into the phase one camera. So I probably will get the phase one camera and use it. Um, and it will become my, my main gear in, in the future. Yep. All right, great. And then one, uh, one last question. We have somebody asking, um, if you could, if you could display the opening slide you had with the five elements one more time. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So the five element I mentioned is the, um, the basic technique, um, yep, let me share my screen. Yeah, the basic technique, understanding the lights, knowing the environments, compositions, and post-processing, yep. All right, great. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it looks like that's all we have. It looks like we covered all the questions that came in. Um, that was a ton of great information. Thank you thank so you. much for joining us. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank, thank you to all our viewers and we'll see you next time.